Hello, my name is Ali Ben Musa, and I'm an ST6 histopathology trainee who have just passed the exam last November. I have been asked to reflect upon my experiences and provide tips for those who are due to attempt the exam. Although I am probably not the best person to provide such advice, I will try my best to portray my own perception of what worked for me and what would have been helpful to know earlier during my training. Here's an overview of what I will be discussing. Preparation, exam overview and tips, logistics, and motivation. A crucial aspect of histopathology training and exam preparation, in my opinion, is realizing early on the gap present between what you see in day-to-day -day practice and what is required for the exam. The extent of the gap will vary according to the region and laboratory you are training at. This reflects the training inequity present within the United Kingdom and elsewhere. The issue is recognized by the college and is part of the driving force behind an online learning project called Digital Now, which is currently work in progress. Ways to deal with this in the meanwhile is by finding and accessing departmental case sets, uh, EQA circulations, actively seeking out particular cases to sign out and retrieving cases from the archives uh, by a targeted search. You can utilize social media where there is a plethora of pathologists and pathology institutions out there with an interest in education on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. There are also digital slide repositories. The most known is Leeds Pathology website but there are also others such as the Rosai Collection and Path Presenter. Attending courses and seminars is also helpful, many of which now have become conveniently online. From my experience, attending one part two preparation course is not enough. And if I knew beforehand, I probably would have done my first one as early as the beginning of ST3, to assess where I stand. These, however, require early booking and planning as they are often oversubscribed and can be expensive. The courses are best attended in person as you get protected time. It can give you an insight in regards to comparing training conditions in different regions and also provides a good opportunity for networking. Ensure that you max out your study leave days and budget. However, having said that, keeping up with your regular signing out is equally crucial as this would represent a substantial element of what you will get in the exam. Safeguarding the balance after all is up to you to assess and address. The building up towards the exam can be mentally and physically tiring. Thus, the intense phase of the final preparation effort might be better done over weeks as opposed to months. Although doing mock exams can be helpful, however, overdoing them is not recommended as they can be time consuming, exhausting, and you would be better off utilizing the limited time for covering a greater quantity of diagnostic material. Another good tip is keeping the revision for the subjects that you are least comfortable with, such as management, closer to the exam date. Understanding the overall exam structure and the closed marking scheme for the short surgical cases and non gynae cytology can help guide your study effort and exam strategy. It is also important to realize that failing any exam component will result in failing of the entire exam. Thus, maintaining performance consistency is crucial. The exam is over two days, and the components are the following. Nangaini cytology, eight pairs, 20 minutes per pair. Frozen sections, two trays with three slides on each, 20 minutes per tray, followed by a viva. Long cases, four cases, 20 minutes per case, OSP1 management, 20 minutes viva, short cases, 10 pairs, 20 minutes per tray. 
macros, two case pairs, 20 minutes per pair, followed by 20 minutes viva. OSPI 2, 20 minutes. Be familiar with the closed marking system out of five, which is used only for the Nungaini cytology and surgical pathology short cases. Marks of zero, four, and five are not usually awarded. Uh, getting the right diagnosis will give you 2.5. If your answer is wrong but not dangerous, you get two. Get any benign slash malignant discrepancy and it's a 1.5. A very good or excellent answer gets you three or 3.5. As a result, uh, getting all the slight diagnosis right on all the cases will make you just about pass as you would score 50 out of 100 in the short cases. So in order to compensate for any 2s or 1.5s or 1s, you will need to score 3 and 3.5 elsewhere. This will be through recommending appropriate further investigations, referrals, MDT discussion, mentioning disease trivia such as syndromic associations, translocations, epidemiology, etc. The possibility of scoring extra points is not possible in all cases and will vary from case to case. Macros and OSPs 1 and 2 are scored out of 10. Long cases are scored out of 20. The most important aspect about Nangaini cytology preparation is volume. You need to see loads in order to get used to recognizing the various appearances a certain entity can have and on different preparations. You probably won't need to do much theoretical revision of Nangaini cytology as you would have covered the systems elsewhere in your revision. Regular sign out at your department can help you prepare but you might be missing out on certain entities where you're practicing. Resources include departmental slide collections, uh, slide sharing with colleagues, or performing a targeted search of your laboratory information system to retrieve certain examples. Courses are great as you get designated time. Uh, you get exposed to different slide preparations as well as getting to see a wide variety of entities. A good exam approach is spending more time seeing the entire slide than writing. A good recommendation that I've heard was eight minutes slide scanning and two minutes writing it up, but it doesn't have to be that rigid. Keep the descriptions brief and to the point. Uh, try and make your diagnosis confident and clear. Is there a specialty specific diagnostic code or system you can use? Usually clear cut cases in the exam, and if there is an abnormality, it will be everywhere on the slide. Fluid cytology tends to feature frequently as plenty of material is present for exam related purposes. There are four long cases, 20 minutes per case. My exam approach is more like dictating a full report at work. Make sure you read the question in which there will be relevant information and non-relevant distractors. Traditionally, there has been a medical renal case uh, other cases vary, but there has been frequent hepatobiliary and lymphoreticular pathology, but anything can come up. You will get an h &E with special stains or immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence or electromicroscopy, depending upon the case. Having a diagnostic algorithm in your head for the hepatic and medical renal case, for example, can help save you time under exam stress conditions. Beware of the time limitation factor and the pressure it creates. Uh, write on alternative lines whilst writing in the answer book, just in case you would need to insert a word in between. Try and keep it neat with clear headings and bullet points. Personally, I'm not a fan of drawing immunohistochemistry tables, but if you think you would prefer drawing, then, then that's fine. Uh, be mindful of what you write though as you might get penalized of mentioning something wrong or something that could be misinterpreted that you are not confident about your diagnosis. Sometimes writing less is more, although there are instances where you will have to write more depending upon the situation. 
marking is out of 20 for each case. As for the short cases, uh, these are usually on the second day, which is the longest exam session, uh, 10 pairs of two slides and 20 minutes for both. Usually an easier case and a more difficult one, but not always. Uh, that's why it is worth casting a quick eye on both so you can decide which one to start with. Remember though, that the first impressions could be deceptive. The diagnostic theme tends to be either a spot diagnosis, uh, a case where there's a differential between two diagnoses and cases in which there is no way to tell the right diagnosis without further investigation. Also beware of the presence of a double diagnosis uh, in a case or two, as well as a possible difficult case that might stir up some discussion. The exam could be themed with a particular system or two, uh, constituting the majority of cases. Always read the brief history provided and use it if needed to demonstrate clinical and pathological correlation. A recommendation I have used is spending two minutes looking at the slide if you can and eight minutes to write, although again, this is not a rigid rule. Um, the key thing is staying calm, uh, thinking before writing and keeping it simple if possible, as there are often plenty of basic entities. However, beware as Simple cases might trigger doubts in regards to whether the diagnosis is what it is and whether there's anything more to it. Pros and sections. From a preparation perspective, try and get involved in doing frozen sections at work when you get the opportunity or at least have a peek at the slides later. Some departments have sets of frozen section recuts. Um, the more you see, the more you would be able to appreciate the distorted morphology and the reporting pressure. Um, a good yardstick for assessing the nature of the lesional cells under the microscope is by comparing them to uh, similar cells and structures that you are confident of in the adjacent background tissue. Um, make sure you see the whole slide. Um, if there are multiple levels, beware that the abnormality could be only present in one level. Um, the diagnostic exam theme is predominantly uh, based upon whether a sampled margin is positive or negative for malignancy. Uh, you might get sampling from an entity which could be benign or malignant. Um, however, there are instances where the nature of the lesion is difficult to determine as further immunohistochemistry or further frozen sections are required. Remember that you are only allowed to defer to paraffin in one case only. Get two slides wrong and the station is failed. The examiner might be trying to ask some probing questions to see whether you understand the implications of your decision, uh, challenge your impression, um, asking where do you think the tumor might have come from, or perhaps playing the role of the surgeon. Um, the key thing is that you have to demonstrate confidence and that you understand the implications of your diagnosis. Macroscopic pathology. Four cases. Uh, two photographs in pairs with related questions, 20 minutes per pair, followed by 20 minutes viva. A mixture of straightforward day-to-day -day specimens and more complex ones that you might not be commonly seen or performed where you have been training. Uh, questions usually about specimen approach, uh, impressions about the possible underlying pathology, blocking, staging, uh, usually a straightforward station. Management. This tends to be the least favored station amongst some exam candidates. Um, it reflects the day-to-day -day challenging situations consultants have to deal with. Um, just try to be sensible and familiar with the relevant management jargon. You will be given a scenario with a couple of questions to answer face-to-face -face over 20 minutes. Common scenarios that featured are quality improvement, uh, clinical governance, uh, key performance indicators, uh, dealing with adversities such as a colleague being off sick or uh, lab equipment failure, um, incident reporting, uh, uh, UK laboratory accreditation, uh, making a business case, etc. Uh, the topic is usually covered well in part two courses and um, there are useful documents on the RC PATH website that you can read. And here is a list uh, where you can pause the video uh, to write them down if you want. Possibly two, uh, 
Uh, this can feel daunting when it is the last exam station, as you're probably feeling tired by then. Um, it's a 20 minutes paper that usually has a clinical scenario with molecular uh, special stains, um, a recently updated data set or management related questions. Uh, make sure you turn over all the question booklet pages as you could underestimate the number of questions present and the time required to answer. Uh, just keep your answers neat, concise, and use bullet points. Travel planning has become more challenging since the pandemic. The college has since aimed to minimize exam center regional travel for candidates within the UK to as much as what is practically possible. Make sure you are keeping in touch with the designated exam organizer and be aware of any recent changes to travel and lockdown measures. For convenience, book your hotel at the exam venue or at least somewhere nearby. Uh, ensure that your booking is refundable just in case the circumstances change. The exam tends to be scheduled on Tuesday and Wednesday. A good plan is to arrive on a Sunday afternoon so that you will have time to relax and do a final revision of your notes. Setting up the microscope and exploring the exam venue usually happens on a Monday afternoon. The new COVID-related exam measures include social distancing between desks, stopping the clock for hand sanitization in between slide tray transfers, and the use of masks when moving around and during the Viva station. Bring a good microscope that you are familiar with. Make sure you are comfortable with setting it up and have a spare bulb just in case. Think about how you're going to carry it. Uh, you might need to bring some non-pathology books or items to prop up the microscope. Ensure that you have an appropriate UK plug and consider bringing an extension lead just in case. Dressing for the day should be smart, but most importantly, comfortable. There is usually a clock at somewhere visible in the room, but it might be worthwhile bringing your own. Try and find what makes you relax after the first day of the exam in order to have the strength to endure the second day. Avoid the temptation of discussing cases after the exam. If you think you might have messed something up, try and ignore it and just carry on because you never know as you might have compensated for it. A good reliable pen you're used to is essential. It might be though worth practicing your handwriting skills under pressure, especially if you haven't been handwriting in a while. My final piece of advice is about your most important asset which is your own self-confidence. Don't let anybody undermine it. And don't listen to other people's exam horror stories. Even if you're not really self-confident, try faking it. This is worthwhile as uh, this can often help soothe the crippling anxieties and stress that can hinder your performance on the day. Remember that you have passed many previous undergraduate and postgraduate exams leading to this point in time. Realize that there is no way on earth you're going to cover everything. You've tried all what you can and you're going to give it your best shot on the day. Also, there's no one way of doing it. Candidates have passed using completely different preparation methods and had access to different training resources. Find what motivates you to keep getting up every day in the morning. One method for coping with anxiety that I've found useful is trying to imagine the worst possible outcome and then thinking of a realistic plan in regards to how to deal with the hypothetical situation. This is followed by accepting and coming to terms with it. Remember that the exam is just a hurdle and not the final destination. It is only afterwards that your professional journey begins. Good luck.